Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the NPR SciCommerce uh, September Mentor Chat. Um, today for this Mentor Chat, we'll be joined by Shay Kill McLean, also known as at hood underscore biologist on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and so this mentor chat will be um, sort of a foundations on um, setting up systems for centering anti-racism in our work, especially in our communications work, so that we can have, have anti-racism um, in the forefront of how we operate rather than um, something that we sort of think about at the end, um, trying to fix things. So it's better to do it right the first time than to hope we did it right at the end. Um, Shay, Kill, if there's anything that you want to say for your introduction, feel free. <laughs> um, I don't feel like there's, there's too much to say. I'll just make sure I introduce myself. <laughs> Shay Kill McLean, um, PhD candidate, Defend Nights Month in, um, Program for Ecology, Evolution, and Conservation Biology at the University of Illinois and Urbana-Champaign. So, um, yeah, my research work is smack dab in the middle of issues, the topics of biology and health uh, and racism and other forms of human domination. So looking at the biological consequences of how people treat each other interpersonally and then at higher scales. All right, so, um, Jekyll, the floor is yours. Okay. <laughs> well, this is, a, okay, y'all bear with me because I try to do this in a way that's going to be most beneficial to everybody. <laughs> and I, I'm going to make sure that um, uh, Tyler gets the, the, PD, uh, the PDF so it can be shared, the slides and everything, um, the PowerPoint. Okay, so the, the main goals of of the workshop it is really just to set a foundation. Like how do you Im implement an anti-racist system, right? For science communication. So uh, like I've divided it really into three modules and the main component modules are two to four. It looks like four, but it's three. It's two to four. The one is the, this is a pre-module, a primer on how, how to think. So that's helpful because different forms of styles of critical thinking can be different across the sciences, humanities, social sciences, and into STEM. So I wanted to just kind of review like what does historical, a sense of historical thinking look like? Okay. So um, first, a bit of a primer on how to think, how we should be thinking about these issues. So the important thing is to always take in consideration that you need information about context, conditions, like what were things like at the moment that an incident occurred or like who were the actors involved? It means you have to ask, how do we get here? What actually happened? Um, and what did this incident or event or interaction change? So, and, all, and also for elaboration points, I talk about there's other components of context. So there could be different demographics a descriptive of what it is, um, who's involved, relative position of the individuals who are involved to one another in the institutions, and et cetera. So this is the, the prime, one of the main components to how we should be thinking about approaching addressing social problems, period. So this one is long and is long because I just want everybody had a whole quote. Not really trying to read through the whole thing, um, but it's, I find it a really, really useful um, explanation for just understanding basic, basic ways to think in abstract thought. Like how do you actually utilize abstract thought as something that you can deploy to figure out what actions you will take to solve a problem? Um, and here the quote is by Bertel Ullman in his book, uh, Dialectical Investigations. And specifically, the thing that's extremely helpful here that he says is that dialectics restructures our thinking about reality by replacing the common sense. Okay, where is my mouse at? Uh, okay, by replacing the common sense notion of, of a thing. Um, a notion of a thing is something that has a history and has external connections with other things with notions of process which contains its history and possible futures and relation. 
and the relation which contains as part of what it is, its ties with other relations. So we're, this is going to be systems thinking <laughs> at a little bit of a high scale. We're going to be moving all the way up from individual all the way up to institutions and, and systematic um, functions. So as noted, everything is a thing with a history and set of relations, right? So understanding anything in our everyday requires that we, we know something about how it arose and developed and how it fits into the larger context of the larger context of um, the system of which it's a part. So it's important to note also that when we talk about systems, because it's very easy to get lost in this. When we talk about systems, we also, we always kind of make it sound like that big thing hanging in the sky. You know, the guys are angry. It kind of sounds like that a lot, <laughs> very abstract. But the important thing to, to take into consideration is that when we speak of systems and institutions, we're talking about people just collectively organized at some scale. For a part or for a particular set of um, rules, relations, as well as our um, interests and purposes. Okay. Oh, let me see. So, first thing to consider: what is race in the first place? Because <laughs> we can't figure out what anti-racism is if we do not know what race is, and we don't know what racism is. So these are really, really important questions for us to take into consideration if we are thinking about some form of anti-racist uh, strategic action that people can take with regards to their research work in, in science communication. So the, what I have on the slide is three common definitions that are seen, of, this is by sociologists predominantly that are generally seen in how people define race. You used to find this in sociological literature, anthropological literature. And the commonality here is people are talking about uh, referring to different types of bodies. It uh, misrecognizes a, a, a natural category based on phenotype or ancestry, or it's a, um, it's a group of human beings socially defined on the basis of physical characteristics. And ultimately, these definitions are answered to that question only if the question has predominantly been answered based on the assumption that race and racism are exactly what European colonizers say they are. And that's important to take into consideration because these definitions do not get as much of anywhere. So just an example of like how we arrive at those definitions this is a typical time scale that Omi and Why Not, How, uh, yeah, yeah, Howard, Why Not, and um, Michael Omi use in racial formation theory to make it to kind of quote unquote demonstrate that race is a social construct, et cetera, et cetera. But they generally leave things out. But it, it starts, they always start with in the encomienda system. And this is the 16th century. We start moving through next, for some odd reason, their analysis skips 200 years. <laughs> and the next thing that they mention is the is events, significant events during the 18th and 19th century. And a lot of this, a lot of the stuff that they, they do mention are respect to like um, naturalization act, looking at what is going on with the late 18th century how there's a shift between religious justifications for race and racism to scientific justifications. And there's a conversation to be had about the relationships between religion and science as institutions in the first place and why race went through those developmental scales. Then they shift to 19th century. You see more conversations about things that are a little bit more familiar, like eugenics, and different things are regarding um, the institution of um, legal statuses. For instance, the Treaty of uh, Guadalupe Hidalgo. And sorry, I'm gonna move this over, okay. And then you get to 20th century, 21st century. There isn't much 
there's just this assumption that everything starts in the 16th century and there's a lot of history that's left out. They assume European contact in the New World is generally just a point of no return. And here colonialism is an event at worst and an epoch at best. And, and race is being understood as something that is based, it's an organizing principle that's based on what people look like, on phenotypic or physical characteristics, which is ultimately incorrect. And then of course, you know, big event, everybody got to talk about the Human Genome Project to verify that race is not in any way accurate or useful when describing human evolution or more specifically human genetic variation. So with that being understood, I'm kind of looking at, well, what do we, what do we do to fix those definitions, right? So I, the definitions that I have and that I'm showing are from some of like predominantly from, from my publications. And then I have that the statement on the left-hand side by um, Utz McKnight um, in a, this, a really useful text, uh, Everyday Practice of Race in America. So this is about once again, thinking about the question. The question, this question is not concerned with the claims nor interests of continuing European colonialism and imperialism. Without those assumptions, the question of what is race becomes, what if we define race as how humans do race? So how, like, how do you do race? How is it, so our attention then is immediately brought to, brought to race in action or rather racialization. So these are the three central components to understanding like how this is operating. Race is a set of the distinction reproduced in service to generating racialized and racist relations and doctrines. Race is always the child of racism. Race did not exist before racism did. That would make absolutely no sense for a long series of reasons, but that did not happen. <laughs> Racialization, well, it's the reproduction of race. So it was the, uh, the social reproduction of racialized distinction or what we, was stated before race and action. And that is what we're concerned with. Interactions, how people act, how people build relationships between themselves as where well other, inst other institutions and other living beings. And then just generally, because um, my, like, my perspective that I take with regards to my research is race, being the child of racism means that race is racism. They're, they should be said together, always. Um, this makes things, uh, a lot easier to understand in an actionable sense because it gives you an, a point of reference for understanding how the historical development of race occurred in the first place that requires that colonialism first invent race for the purpose of racism in order for it to perpetuate itself. So racism is a colonial breeding principle that governs and mediates lives through the active making and management of relational indexes of hegemonic difference. Um, and one of the things that I, like, I really like this um, McKnight quote, because I, I found it to be um, really helpful to get people detached a little bit from and unlearning the um, hyper focus on physical characteristics with respect to race. Uh, and as, um, of course, McKnight states, race occurs without seeming reference to an original act of differentiation. It is not experiences or beliefs or specific phenotypal elements that create racial prejudice, but prejudice in the form of material and social practices that create the possibility of difference. So the, or the sense of the physical characteristics being the predominant thing that is driving racism is not true. Though that the idea that it was because people looked different and had different cultures, they ain't never seen each other before, those were uh, post hoc justifications that Europeans came up with after they had already engaged in uh, settler colonial actions. So with that understand, uh, understanding, we, we see that race is not based on appearance. Racialization is best understood as race in action or the act of productivity of race. As Patrick points out, different, different racializing practices seek to maintain population-specific modes of colonial domination through time. 
So thus racism is not when one racial group is antagonistic to another racial group. And, and that definition is, is come from AS, the American Sociological Association uses a definition quite similar to that. And so does the, a lot of the anthropological work on race um, that follows the traditions of, um, why am I blanking on his name? The anthropologist. He contributed to writing the UNESCO statement in 1950 and 1951. His name will come up later. I'll probably scream it out at random and it'll make no sense in relation to anything else. <laughs> Um, but one of the things that um, I think is important about what Patrick Wolf points out is that race is extremely adaptable. And most specifically, its adaptability is, was sufficient to accommodate the complexity of imperialism's far-flung network of unequal social relations. So for every articulation, relations of slavery, indenture, dispossession, um, comparatorship, or intermediation of commercial exchange, there was a corresponding racial category that could be nominated. With that being said, that this is how we can understand at the same time with the creation of race, race is most specifically also capitalist. Inherently, these things are being built together. So with, uh, with that understanding, how do we make sense of race, right? First, we have to understand colonialism. And we have to stand, understand power. Uh, one of the references that um, Omi and Why Not make in racial formation theory talks about race as a, a way of making up people, right? So how do you engage in that way of making up people? Colonialism. <laughs> That's the specific system that we're interested in, process we're interested in. And it has to, it's an issue of power, not attitude, not feelings, power. Because <laughs> a lot of times people think, well, you know, I'm not racist. I'm nice to people who are in another racial group. That's not how it works at all. Um, racism, white supremacy functions quite fine and effectively um, despite the existence of nice white people. So it's important to know, you know, power is our ability to exercise or carry out specific will or demands despite resistance. So power is the probability that one actor within a social relationship will be in a position to carry out their will despite the resistance of the other actor. And I think what kind of illustrates that that process of making up people is thinking about um, how do you get whiteness? Instead of thinking, because a, a lot of focus on race is generally a hyper focus specifically on blackness and what makes black people black we just, and, that, and that's found in a lot of the the um early 17th and 18th scientific literature and research and stuff that you see produced in your own um, throughout europe and as well as in the united states so like um uh, historian gerald horn refers to um whiteness as forged by enslaving colonialism and a pan-European concord in order to overall rebellious Africans and indigenous. And specifically, this is talking about a particular form of group or, or class solidarity. But in order to create, to create whiteness, you first have to create the other categories. So indigenous, First, and that's a part, and that's not a simple, simply a cultural reference. Indigeneity is specifically in reference to uh, power relations in land. If you are indigenous, that's because the colonizer came. You can only be indigenous if a colonizer comes and try to take your land. That's how that works. And then there's a similar dynamic with respect to Africans, but people of African Africans specifically during this time period. And since around four, at least around 1451, were displaced and dispossessed. Like Africans are still indigenous peoples, just indigenous to another place. Displaced and dispossessed indigenous peoples that were brought to the Americas to displace and dispossess other indigenous peoples. So 
one group, one race is, that is created, and then another is created to then create another race <laughs> that constantly keeps going on. And that pattern is, is actually uh, the main thing that I try to get people to focus on. So with respect to that continuing our understanding of the colonial origins of racism, right? So this is, uh, this is a quote on the left from the book, The Invention of the White Race by Theodore Allen. And I think this is the first one, volume one, because there are two volumes. Um, and the, the first couple of chapters are really, really, really useful. Uh, the, the quote reads, the assault upon the tribal affinities, customs, laws, and institutions of the Africans, the American Indians, and the Irish by English slash British and Anglo-American colonialism reduced all members of the oppressed group to one undifferentiated social status, a status beneath that of any member of any social class within the colonizing population. This is the hallmark of racial oppression in its colonial origins and as it has persisted in subsequent historical contexts. So with that being said, how do we then look at the historical timeline again and see and, and span out a little bit? Let's look a little earlier and look at different kinds of events, right? So 14th century, this is around the, the great crisis of European feudalism. Europe was going through it. Now, <laughs> by 1451, the transoceanic slave trade is thought to have begun around this time, right? By 1455, Pope Nathaniel V issues a papal decree to seize, capture, and enslave all enemies of Christ along the west coast of Africa. Since the 16th century, Europeans are, they see the world as organized in a particular hierarchy of a great chain of being. So this is where we get some of the cultural and historical um, prototypes for race, the creation of race. And we see that, you know, between 1513, 1604, the, the early Spanish and French colonies are established in North America. And this is where it gets important, where things are significant. So if you see 1619, right? The first enslaved Africans arrive in the British colonies, specifically I put British colonies, because enslaved Africans were already on the continent of America. <laughs> it's important that we make sure we make that distinction. And now mind just 1619. By 1662, in a Virginia colony, the law of partisan sequitur ventrum was passed. And it, it, what the law basically does is extends the status of freedom or slavery from the mother to the child. So basically it's framed as like the, the child takes the status of the mother. Part of Seguter Ventrum. This was, is, is what is central in the creation of Blackness. Because at this point in time, and prior to that, race was not needed in order to colonize, for Europe to successfully colonize this, different places. They didn't necessarily have to do that. It became extremely beneficial over time when they started looking at different populations that they wanted to co-opt into their economic systems specifically slave, um, the, a slave economy. Then you see 1676, Bacon's Rebellion. By 1691, you see the first legal use of the term white. white whiteness wasn't made first. That's important to know. It came after. <laughs> they made indigeneity, and then they made blackness, and then they made whiteness. And it actually gets a little, even more interesting. So we, like, we're looking at the significance of all of these different events. Okay, now moving to the 18th century. You see some of the um, <laughs> really interesting things that are done in science. Um, the, one of the sc scholars, Comte de Buffon, uh, he introduced, introduced the concept of race into the science study of human variation. So, which is indicating and letting us know that this thing is considered something that is, all, is new, right? 
and is being incorporated into the study of, of humans. 1763, the Royal Pro Proclamation assigned key components of Indian relations, land, diplomacy, and trade to London's central government. So this is extremely important with regards to understanding a series of revolutions that came after that. And during the, the late 1700s, you see some of the first instances of segregating, uh, the, the seg of racial segregation, uh, specifically in the capital of British India in Calcutta. So they basically experimented and tried out different ways that they would structure cities based on those relationships. And now this is significant too. 1791, 1804, the Haitian Revolution begins. The reason why that's important <laughs> is because around this, around the time of the Haitian Revolution, we end up seeing some really interesting things happen. So specifically, the transoceanic slave trade is ended three years after the end of the Haitian Revolution. Next year, 1808, federal prohibition of the importation of enslaved peoples. And more specifically, in 1803, a British co colonial administrator, and this is, um, this is a, based off of a colonial archive document, John Sullivan suggests, he suggested introducing Chinese indentured servants to the island of Trinidad to suppress the rebellion of African slaves and expand capitalist production with a new free race who could be kept distinct from the Negroes. They had a problem, they made a new race. <laughs> Let y'all fight each other and we still make money. So, <laughs> and then, now mind you, all of this is happening way before we have the term gene. The word gene isn't created until 1909. The one drop rules in the early 1900s, it didn't, none of those things existed before. So that, that is letting us know that central components to how, how race and racism operate are being constructed over time. They weren't, this, this is, wasn't due to some sense of a, a predetermined or inevitable, inevitable or innate set of characteristics or dynamics. Okay. So once again, you see the create, particularly the creation of Asian race, specifically Chinese in, in, in the Caribbean, their labor used in order to try to push against Haitian revolution, the creation of the one drop rule, the, the word, the creation of the word gene, and then looking at more experiments of segregate, racial segregation in Shanghai and Hong Kong. Okay. So with that being said, it's important for us to understand that racism is race. These things are the same thing. <laughs> race can only exist and operate under racist conditions because that's what ended up making it. So one of the things that um, Patrick Wolf states that I found very helpful to make sense of this is that race is a set of classificatory regimes that seek to order subject populations differently in pursuit of particular historical agendas. To this extent, the term racism seems redundant since race is already an ism. And um, this is from his book, Traces of History. And the following quote is a, a Du Bois quote that, that is really helpful for understanding um, a larger, uh, larger framework with regards to social change and systems thinking, specifically with respect to social problems. Uh, so Du Bois defines social problems as ever a relation between conditions and action, and as conditions and actions vary and change from group to group, from time to time, and from place to place. So social problems change, develop, and grow. So this is letting us know that we're talking about content, dynamic contingent events that are occurring over time. So given what we, we, we've discussed about what race and racism are, right? What's anti-racism? How do we make sense of that? 
and one of the things that I was thinking about was also most importantly, what does anti-racism look like in action? Like, what does it look like to do something anti-racist? So based on those definitions that we've already discussed, we know that it's clear that anti-racism is fundamentally against the reproduction of racialized distinctions to, that sustain racism, theoretically, as well as in practice. It involves, it involves unlearning racism, and it also must involve individual, interpersonal slash collective, and institutional transformative action. And one of the things I think is important about grounding this definition is understanding what um, France, Fanon, uh, France Omar Fanon referred to as decolonization, because this, this is a buzzword, everybody like using it, nobody know what it means. So i am make sure I go to Fanon <laughs> so we can get the definition. Decolonization is truly the creation of new men. Decolonization, therefore, implies the urgent need to thoroughly challenge the colonial situation. If your actions do not thoroughly challenge the colonial situation, they are not anti-racist. <laughs> I don't make the rules, it is what it is. <laughs> okay, so let's try to think this through, right? Then this is basically for everybody to just try themselves and um, to kind of like work through. Think of one to two social problems that are reproduced by racism within your respective discipline. It could be the way people talk about certain things. It could be the discipline produces particular technological devices that are used to harm different communities, et cetera, et cetera. And when thinking about that, just try to keep in mind that racism is a system, right? And it operates at a series of levels, individual, interpersonal, institutional. And given the fact that it, uh, those things are operating in a systemic fashion, that means it's basically occurring across institutions in ways that like all the parts are interdependent. So anything that affects one part of the system, it has consequences for the whole. Now, when attempting to think about like some of these social problems, I'll give an example. A social problem that my research work kind of touches on is the, the, the issues regarding uh, racist health disparities. It could be maternal mortality rate, black infant mortality rate, the, some of the leading, leading causes of death in the United States, coronary heart failure, stroke, like black people generally and indigenous people lead all of those categories. So with taking into consideration, now I have to think about, well, how is that, how does that happen, right? How does that happen all the way from the institutional level all the down to individual. Well, what affects people's health? What are the basic needs? What do you need to be healthy? So it changes some of our questions, right? And most importantly, within that is asking about who's affected by the social problem and in what ways. And then identifying material, like two to three material and political needs of those colonized communities. Because ultimately, the problem we have to find a solution to it. If we're talking about being act, actively engaged and, and the only way to combat racism is to do, take action. So <laughs> it's important for us to have a sense of understanding regarding rooting our analysis of social problems in the context of who is actually affected by them. So that means that we have to have some type of relationship established with the communities that are, are affected by the by racism ultimately and i, I have a kind of little glossary on the side to give some context for what these terms are specifically the thing to pay attention to is making sense of a need a need is a gap between what is and what ought to or should be so your desired results minus the current state or conditions equals what uh, equals the need that's like the goal is for you to make an assessment of what is needed by the people who are the most affected by the systemic problem so then moving from thought to action so um one of the things that i think was extremely helpful for trying to make sense of this is a quote from kwame nkrumah who is the first uh, president of Ghana uh, um, after 
they abolished um, colonial British colonial rule. In a colonial situation, positive action and negative action can be discerned. Positive action will represent the sum of those forces seeking social justice in terms of the destruction of oligarchic exploitation and oppression. Negative action will correspondingly represent the sum of those forces tending to prolong colonial subjugation and exploitation. So positive action is revolutionary and negative action is reactionary. So taking Nkrumah's quote in, into mind, because well, the conditions and the context is the colonial situation. Racism it reproduces and continues and ensures that it can, the colonial situation continues and exists. It's the only way that we, the world is made, the modern world. So then we have to think about what positive actions can be taken to meet the needs of the communities that are most impacted by racism, right? And ultimately, if we're trying to think about how we get to, we get from theory and historical analysis and stuff to an action, we have to think about like what we can do with taking the information we have and turning it into something that can be executed to meet a need. And it's important to note, of course, you know, we need applied effective action. Positive actions, are, they must be applied. Like the only way that they are meaningful is if it's done, right? So it's important for us to know that even if we have good ideas and we have, a, we believe, have what we believe is a good understanding of the problem, if we are not executing or taking action to try to address it on an individual or interpersonal scale, then we aren't doing anything. That means that the change is not likely to occur. So going on to kind of like the idea of trying to understand creating a, an anti-racist action plan. And this is, um, this is a quote from one of my favorite sociologists, Ruha Benjamin, an uh, article that she wrote, um, I think in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, um, informed refusal towards a justice-based bioethics. An informed refusal, in other words, is seated with a vision of what can and should be, and not only a critique of what is. Uh, I'm trying to remember who says this. I think it's Patrice Lumumba, if I'm not mistaken, or Milcar Cabral. We're not going to overthrow imperialism by shouting insults at it. You, we have to do, we have to move beyond racism is bad. Okay, what you gonna do? <laughs> like, yes, it's bad. We all agree on that. So how do you stop it? <laughs> and that's one of the things to pay close attention to because having that historic, the historical information that we went through before we got to this point, that's important because you need to, your engaged action, which means, and also your refusal to engage in particular actions that are racist, it has to be informed. You need to be able to recognize when something is racist in the first place. So, and one of the things that's important to note, whether any of us like it or not, nothing is, is neutral. Um, a quote from Bordeaux, Pierre Bordeaux, um, in 1982 at an inaugural lecture at the College, um, College de France, because nothing is less neutral in the world of society, than the authoritative utterance of being. The findings of science inevitably exert a political effect, which may not be that which the discussion intended. Science is political, no matter what your intentions are. <laughs> Whether we like it or not, it is what it is. That means we have to start taking these things into consideration. How does that then change how we do our work? as well as how we communicate our work to the public, right? So I think like a helpful, a help, like a helpful exercise to kind of think about creating an anti-racist action plan is, is thinking about like create one to two questions that you think that scientists in your field should be asking themselves when designing a research project that combats racism and respects the knowledge and self-determination of the affected community. Excuse that typo, I will fix that later. Uh, what kind, the second question, what kind of needs exist in this community? Do any of these resources 
um, resource needs match services or assets that are offered by the institution that the scientist works at or another institution within the scientist network. Three, create one or two questions that community members can or should ask researchers and scientists to ensure that their communal needs are addressed and gauge the control they have over how their stories are told. All of these things have to do with relationships to power between individuals and resources and institutions as well. And also is understanding what the issue is. So we have to start there to make an assessment of what the problem is and then how we will attempt to solve it. So one of the core components of anti-racist, um, uh, kind of sense of an anti-racist action system for scientists, period, is making sure you rethink everything, basically, especially your research design and analysis. And method is always important, of course, but methodology is generally driven by your research design and philosophical grounding. <laughs> so if you get that part right, the likelihood <laughs> of you getting the methods correct and leading to analysis is increased. So one of the things I like question a uh, set of questions I was thinking about regarding how do we rethink research design and analysis. So what are the underlying assumptions of the research question? Are these questions aligned with the interests of colonizers or the colonized? Um, what risks do your research pose for the people who live in a typical working poor black neighborhood and or in the indigenous community? Just like think about all the way down the pipeline. And the, and the thing is, there are people who do things like create software, so they feel like they don't really affect people, like, you know, and ultimately, everything we do affects everyone else. So we have to start thinking about that at a, at a larger system scale. Um, next question, who is positioned to benefit from your research, your research work or your project? Are any stakeholders being exploited? And if so, who? How can the power relations be shifted to benefit the, those affected by racism? And also, who is the project accountable to? As long as we have this information, it sets it up so we can be informed. We can take an inf informed positive action, no matter what ends up occurring while we are doing our research work. So ultimately, what we're really asking is what are you going to do <laughs> to combat racism? Not what you just going, what you know, what books you going to read than that. It goes with that. This is about changing behavior, changing the way people build relationships as well as resource institutions. So it requires change in thought, ideology, as well as action. So one of the things I was thinking about, because continuing from my example, well, the, it, one of the main social problems that my research work deals with is health disparities, right? Racist health in inequities. Um, so, and this is actually from Dorothy Roberts' book, uh, Fatal Invention. Written in, um, it's in this, the fourth chapter where she talks about David Satcher's research work um, that he did on looking at the black-white uh, white mortality gap. If every day a jumbo jet carrying 230 black passengers hit cruising altitude and then it crashed to the ground killing everyone on board, it will, it, that would be an accurate estimate of how many black people die from race, racial health inequities every day. Now mind you, we've heard of a number of other statistics to, in, that are similar to this. Um, Every 28 hours, a black person is usually is killed by a police officer. That was, um, and I, I think that statistic was developed by a report that was designed by, I'm trying to remember the, the name of that organization. It was a community organization. Um, I think it was the Black is Back Coalition, I think. Um, but that number, comparison, like, and I always talk to people about that. Um, you think police brutality is bad? It is. That ain't it though, that ain't all of it. More people die every day 
from the other stuff you don't see. <laughs> the things that are considered mundane that we are told we should, our individual's responsibility and, and not a larger systemic issue. So if, if we're gonna have a conversation about what we're going to do about racist health inequalities, then we need an assessment of what it is, like what is, what's the problem? And then what should the situation be? What, what should, like what solution do we want? Where do, what outcome do we desire? ultimately. So when we're asking like what is the, um, the current state or the current conditions, we have to ask what the problem is. Identify the stakeholders and parties involved. And that, that includes also in, in especially regards to situating yourself in there. You're in, you are, we're all a part of this. Nobody's getting away scot-free. There's a scientist or researcher and you can work at a series of different institutions. We know that. Political representatives and policymakers, federal institutions, for example, capitalist corporations, like example, Nestle thinks it's cool to own water. Um, <laughs> just an example. Um, Amazon, like thinking about the, the role that they play in the price, uh, the pricing and cost of different kinds of food in racialized, racially segregated neighborhoods and class segregated neighborhoods. And specifically, in this example, our concern is with the, the, of the affected populations of people who are racialized as Black. The third thing to do is, of course, identify some positive actions that, that, that can be taken to meet the basic needs of those who are affected by the problem at each level. In each level, we refer to before, remember, institutional, systemic, interpersonal, individual. So thinking institutional, the families, education, healthcare institutions, religion, et cetera, et cetera. Systemically across all of those institutions in a crap ton of ways. Interpersonally, how do, like, look at people's relationships with one another. Do people know their neighbor? Do they know, uh, what do they know about their neighbor and about their neighbor's kids? Do they look out for one another on their block? What is their class situation? You, those pieces of information are central to understanding conditions are producing a situation where at least 230 black people are dying every day from racial health inequalities. Now mind you, that number is a massive because that research work was done in like 2005 by David Sasser. Um, then that number is considerably higher, especially given the context of the present pandemic. So after we think about the different positive actions that can be taken at different levels, we can then identify the different organizations that we need to bring together the problem, right? So when we're thinking what, what should it be? Black people should be healthy. And rich, I tell sis, and it's to, to have a good quality of reassessment of what are the basic needs, right? And this is still part of assessing how do we end up here. So basic needs includes things like food, water, shelter, clothing, health care, education, Etc. So, because ultimately, if people are taken care of and their basic needs are met, that means that the community is working to create the conditions that are necessary to facilitate their physical and mental well-being and to be sustained. And that that contributes to the, an increased possibility of, a, a, for instance, longer life expectancy amongst that said community. So, if that we're trying to look at what is what actions could be required in order to get us to what the world should be like, right? So, that example, just thinking about, so keep in mind, 230 Black people a day. Now, now and mind you, this is generally avoidable health conditions, like things that can be treated. We have intervention for, but people are dying. So what conditions are they living in the everyday scale, right? For example, so we know that racial capitalism 
exploits colonized peoples to generate surplus value and make a profit. And we know that because we have an understanding of the existence of the race and wage, the, um, the race and gender wage gap. So let's consider the effects of the race and gender wage gap on cis black women in settler America, the United States. So on average, black women in the United States make 64 cents on the white male dollar. That doesn't sound like a lot and it's not, and it, but it also doesn't sound like, it, oh, 64, it's not that bad, is it? Well, it is because that's almost $20,000. Every black woman is losing $20,000 every year. They're underpaid by almost 20 Gs. Now, mind you, the median wage for, our, for a white non-Hispanic, for white non-Hispanic men is $53,488 a year. For black women, once again, like the 19,399. And this is based on the American Community Survey yearly, um, three year estimates. The, the last time I think they did that was in 2013. I do not believe one was done in 2016. Um, another example, we're thinking about the ways that racism function operates in our society. One of the central components is through zoning and the structure, uh, zoning, policing, the structure and maintenance of uh, segregated, racially segregated neighborhoods and areas. So um, we can then look at thinking about where food is, how much it costs, what's the quality of said food. The, these things end up coming into play regarding setting up the conditions for people to be healthy. And an important point is uh, there was a U.S. Department of Agriculture study that found that uh, low-income residents pay 4% more for food than suburban residents. And as well, and research has also shown that Black neighborhoods are more likely to be food, food deserts. Uh, or what, if I'm not mistaken, I think, um, I'm trying to remember her name, Washington, she referred to as food apartheid. Because ultimately, it's not, a, it's not that, it's not that there is, it's not a desert in the sense that there is no food there. All the food there is food that will likely not nourish you and likely kill you. So for instance, instead of having fresh produce within less than a mile of where I live, there's bodegas. I can get a zebra cake, a, like I can get me some chips, I can get a soda. Those are the kind of options, but there's no fresh fruit. There's no array of affordable, vegetables like just to, just to give an example and now going back to kind of thinking about conceptualizing the wage gap with, with regards to what that looks like resource wise if the wage gap were eliminated a black woman who works full time for a year would have 153 more weeks of food for her family approximately 2.9 years worth of food or the equivalent of 21 more months worth of rent. It's clear what the needs are based on the nature of the conditions. So one of the component, like, so one of the things that I think is a, a crucial component is like, not just making an assessment of the problem, but also making sure we have an understanding of ultimately what we can do about it. Where are we in the process of the production of this issue? And also look at the language that is used to communicate the problem. Is it like you have to think about how you talk about race and make sense of race and how it operates. So grounding into those histor the historical definition is extremely important because it sets us up to then make sure that we have an understanding that is not grounded in race, racialized distinctions and assumptions. And okay, so this is, that was it, that's all. I have this introduction to race, racism and science reading list is also on my website on the, in the, 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 the drop down menu for the learning tools. But these are some of the like central texts and a good chunk of ones that I cited, of course, Fatal Invention, uh, History of White People, Traces of History, Apocalypse of Settler Colonialism, um, 
Black Marxism, Making of the Black Radical Tradition. These are really just really good texts that are helpful. And in, in more specifically texts that discuss um, the relationships between race, racism and biology, um, specifically genetics, it can be found through the, the most recent uh, statement that the American Association of Physical Anthropology designed on race and racism. And I, and I have a crap ton more resources and learning tools on my websites. So decolonizeallthethings.com and decolonizeallthescience.com. And on decolonizeallthescience.com, there is a scientific ethics statement that runs through a series of like questions and things that can be asked. And there's a, a reading list and kind of like it goes through a series of different principles, the Belmont Report and et cetera. So there, there are a number of different learning tools that I know that are out there because I put them out there and then, uh, and then a crap ton more added on to that that I point to on my website. So anybody got any questions or concerns? <laughs> so thank you for that, Shay Akil. Um, again, if anyone has questions, now is the time to ask them. Um, and if you are not comfortable asking out loud, you can always um, put them in the chat box yeah, sure. to everyone or to me and I'll ask them. Um, but ask questions, y'all. <laughs> hey, Tyler, it looks like the chat is disabled. Oh my gosh, of course it is. Uh, well, then, <laughs> I think you're going to have to all say it out loud. Sorry for that. <laughs> Hi, uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, Hi, uh, thanks so much for talking with us today. Um, so, I'm from Korea and I moved to the US uh, for grad school like six years ago. Um, so when you were first defining um, how race came about, my mind started to wonder when the concept of race was first um, like conceptualized in Asia. It, would it be correct for me to assume that it also came from, um, came at the same time when Europeans started to, you know, invade Asia? Thanks. Yeah. From 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 what I know, the context that I have historically, yes. So it, it was also introduced to um, to the East by Europeans because <laughs> they were doing like, and it was slow. And mind you, it was slowly done from the the Near East to the Far East over time. Um, and I'm trying to think who was mainly responsible, like because mainly the British, in most cases. Yeah, they, they're awful, yeah. <laughs> they're usually responsible for a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think um, if I'm not mistaken, it was introduced through the same colonial um, engagements through like predominantly from Britain. They Thank utilize the same, similar racial regimes. And mm -hmm. and then there's, cause I'm, I'm thinking about a, a wide variety of examples in in, age, in like the Far East with respect to like racial regimes because the, the racial regimes are different. There's different late racial logics and how people are quote unquote identified and grouped in different places based on the contextualized history and as well as the, the specific interests of the colonial um, parties involved. So if if I'm not mistaken, I think that's really where that term came from because all the prototypes that we have um, that predate race, what we know of as race, European. I don't know. Did that answer your question? Um, you, your voice was so, uh, your internet connection was so off at the end, but I think that answered my question. Oh. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. My bad. Sorry about the internet, y'all. Any other questions? Hey, I have a question for you. Um, I'm, I'm trying to square something in my mind and hoping you can shed some clarity. But you talk about how race was a concept that was invented as a justification for colonialism or for you know for for some people to 
uh, like justify being above others, right? Uh, but then the concept of race is so ingrained in our society at this moment where we talk about situations like, you know, you mentioned uh, race segregated communities and like uh, that have that are food deserts, for example. But in that construction, we are using race as a descriptor of a situation that exists right now. So if race is something that is inherently racist and that was created to the detriment of certain groups of people, how do we still address concerns about that given the way our society is formed today? So like, how do we look at a de food desert and say that this is a racially segregated community if we don't want to propagate the use of race as a negative thing if i'm, I'm sorry if that was a rambling question but I'm, I'm trying to loop back to the to that connection no it's not rambling it's not a question so um like what your question is a, 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 a confusion this is something that i usually have to like talk about on a number of different basis with when I work with um, my students about this like in social classes. So racism, right? So race can only is the child of racism. The only way that people can be grouped by races is, is for racist <laughs> specifically for colonial interests. With that being said, when we recognize different groups, like I don't I don't know if you noticed earlier in the slides, I didn't use the language of um, racial identity or uh, or, you know, a racial antagonism, racialized. This is an external process. If I tell, if I decided, because here's an example. We didn't have so many examples of white women getting caught race playing recently. I could never get away with that. Because if I say, you know what, I'm over this. I'm a white man. Does that change the way people treat me? <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> it does nothing. So it's it's an external process. It's about how other people are taught and socialized with regards to how to treat you, as well as those collective institutions, what access to resources you were supposed to have. So when we're referring to racialized people and their experiences, and we're talking about issues with regards to like racial segregation, it's about racism. So it's not about seeing about changing the idea that a racial group it goes from bad to good but it's more about paying close attention to the way that this like they are systemically grouped and then collectively gathered and forced into different spaces whether it be for well whether it be in an economic sense a physical geographic sense etc i don't know that like i'm hoping to answer your question but because i'm trying to think of because I, I think part of what you were asking is kind of like the sense of how do we, how do people go from seeing difference as something that's bad to something that's good, almost. But ultimately, it's not an issue of it's not an issue of diversity. This uh, racism doesn't exist because there's variation. Racism exists because of the particular interests of colonizers. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the others. Like it's not because we all look different. So it's able to. So that's not really the value that we're trying attempting to change. If anything, we're attempting to understand the historical development of how we got here, so that we can then understand what is required to undo what has been done and do something different, and figure out what that different thing is. I guess I have a follow up question that maybe feels like it's related to hers, but um, the. <laughs> It, it seems to me like, you know, what you said earlier of anti-racist writing or science or whatever must avoid reproducing these kind of distinctions between races, that seems like it, you know, it runs the risk of this kind of like, I don't see color or like, you know, everyone is, everyone is equal, racism is over kind of narrative. So I guess I'm curious of like, how do you, how do you simultaneously acknowledge like obvious, you know, just like current societal differences between races and you know insofar as like some people are oppressed and some people aren't while also not reproducing the idea of race in a harmful way well that well and that's one of the things it requires well first political education 
no, none of that goes down in any way if you do not understand what race is. You don't understand this historical development. So that's that's a central component. That's one. Two, another way to not reproduce that is just understanding that these are about differences of power. Like one group of individuals has a ton of access to resources and opportunities solely because they murdered a shit ton of people and enslaved them for hundreds of years. So when we talk about it, what it actually is, because truth, because one of the things that reminds me of is um, uh, Du Bois has a quote about uh, that he used in one of his articles to define blackness. And I'm trying to remember it, but he, I think it was more specifically, he talked about it having to do specifically with those Africans some 200 years ago who were brought here to the Americas. So it's giving you context for the depopulation of one continent to then moving, dis, uh, displacing those people to another continent to then depopulate that continent. So this is about colonial relationships. It's about, it doesn't have to, like, there's no way, the, the notion of colorblindness, I don't see difference. I don't, you know, with, that's BS in the first place because this does not have to do with that. So that's always bullshit. <laughs> Just to make it a little easier, because the thing is that you're not you don't you don't need to necessarily when we are saying understand racism, we are not saying in any sense you need to see the physical characteristics that differentiate groups. That's not what that means. What we're saying is you need to see how the those said physical characteristics come to be pointed to or as representations for meaning something else. So that then points to a whole series of actions that were done throughout history, as well as what is continually done today. Uh, Helen, you had a question? Um, I I'm asking about reparations i guess my um what what things you think are strong about reparations i guess my big question would be is there any small thing i can do a group to support or something um so what you have to say about reparations um rep <laughs> okay so reparations especially in the context of the united states and it's it, it, it gets complicated hella fast. And I say it gets complicated hella fast is because of this. In order for Black people to get reparations, <laughs> for instance, <laughs> yep. Europeans have to basically provide a crap ton of resources regarding what was extracted, right? But most mm -hmm. importantly, if they admit that they stole people and labor and resources, they got to admit they stole the land. So if you give them reparations, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> there's a whole nother level. <laughs> so it it gets it gets really complicated very quickly. So that's one. So if anything, there's a there's a symbol a, 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 a series of different things that can be done. Um, generally, when I tell I tell people if you think about something that's on the individual scale, like what what are the people the people who you know historically they're colonized and racialized in your life every day? How do you support them? Do you make sure that that they're doing all right, rent is paid, it's food on the table, like ba meeting basic needs is central. And then also making sure you keep an eye out for local as well as national organizations that you know for a fact, put resources in the hands of people who need them, who are affected by the problem. Um, besides like, and at a larger scale, as that goes up, that requires massive organization, like requires mass organization. And, and truth be told, most importantly, a lot of that form, those forms of organization have to be from different kind of vantage points in the sense to where it requires that, for instance, um, as Malcolm X said, white people have to go into their own communities. They gotta go talk to y'all people. It like, anti-racism is not showing up to the nearest POC neighborhood, <laughs> racialized neighborhood, and going, I'm here to help. Do not do that. 
don't do that. <laughs> it, you have to talk to other white people. You need to get other white people in check. So that's one. Not to mention also understanding it. Like, for instance, if we know that what is consistently done by the state militarized forces, the police, at protests against police brutality, if we know what they're going to do is constantly victimize all the protesters and harass them, beat the crap out of them, then what kind of strategies need to be taken? If we, like, for instance, all a good example, if I'm trying to remember what protest it was, but in where it was, it was a whole bunch of white people lined up and they were all in front of the racialized people. <laughs> the the police wasn't going through them. Like, strategic, like, it requires that we organize a little bit differently. Thinking about strategy and tactics, not to mention the fact that protesting is just a tactic. It's not the only thing, even though we all think it is. <laughs> Thank you. So I think yeah, that the something was taken that too, that, that, that and part is the problem. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question, but Tyler, I don't know if I haven't been keeping track of the chat box. I don't want to go before somebody else who had a question earlier. Um, okay, I'll just go ahead. So first of all, thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna say like, just a comment for point of discussion and then I have a question. So the comment is, I'm from Syria and we, and while I was there, of course, I never really, I, I wasn't aware of any of this stuff because over, over there, um, well, you know, when you grow up in a community and you get indoctrinated or whatever it is, um, you're not aware of a lot of stuff, but I'm learning a lot of interesting histories uh, related to race and racism and the enslavement of Africans by Arabs in the Middle East. Um, not so much in Syria specifically, but in the Middle East in general, uh, mainly in the, in, the, um, in the Arabian Peninsula. So, so that's just one comment. It's interesting to learn these things um, now and reflect on the communities I grew up in. Um, my question is, is um, you know, feel free not to answer if it's not in the scope of this talk, but I'm really interested in the fact that you said that you're a PhD candidate, which I am too. And um, I'm just interested to hear from you, like how you juggle the work that you're doing right now, um, because from what I understand, this talk that you just gave us isn't the focus of your research, but it's it's what you use in your research, right? And what That's we should all be... Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, I said correct, yeah. Okay, so I'm just curious, like, because there's, you know, a lot of us um, in, on, in the trainee level are now, you know, this year when, when apparently institutions are waking up to things that have been going on forever, are being asked to sit on committee after committee and make recommendations mm -hmm. and blah, 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 and all these things. Hopefully, hopefully with some action, you know, but we'll see. Um, and that, of course, is a lot of labor and time. So I'm just curious if you would like to share what your experience has been like. Honestly, I, my research, like, so this is slightly connected to my work to some extent. Um, specifically, I, um, I deal more with the racialization of genetics and biology and the general consequences um, of that. Um, and, and particularly my dissertation work, I propose understanding racism as an ecological system. Like it's setting and shaping the conditions, the interactions, this, this is the conditions that people are living in that shapes, therefore, like the kind of lives they have. So um, this is connected to it to a certain extent, but also grounded in the organizing work that I was doing before I even started, well, before I even knew what I was going to study, like for PhD, before I knew what I was doing for the dissertation. So it's, uh, I balance it just by trying to take the research work that I'm, that I consistently do and making sure I constantly give those, like give those educational resources to local community members. That's all the reason why I have my website. Like I find I, like the work I've just been trying to find ways to where I can make sure that everybody people know the things they need to know to be actively engaged in changing what's going on. 
Yeah, I, I've uh, I've checked out your website and there's a ton of resources there. So thank you for curating those. No problem. Like I'm I'm I rather do it and have that stuff up there so people can learn than they just not like act knowledge education. All this stuff should be free. I I firmly believe that, but like I don't run the world, so <laughs> I don't do any of this. Yep, <laughs> I don't I make hope, no decisions. I hope you are getting some kind of pay for some of these efforts, honestly. Some, yes. <laughs> Hi, Shay. It's Kyle. Uh, hey, hey, Kyle. Hey, you. Um, first of all, thank you for doing this uh, with us, especially on a day like today. And I want to acknowledge, you know, the strength and energy that you're bringing to educate us and our community. Um, I wanted to also acknowledge the like the work that you've done, for example, with the uh, American Association of Physical Anthropology to have a more thorough and in-depth definition um, of, you know, race and racism, especially in the sciences. I think one of the things that I'd love to hear from you is how marginalized folks and Black folks in our community, how we can help better create spaces for them to, to recuperate, you know, to thrive in times like this where yeah, we have to we have to do the work to to even learn what anti racism means. But um, you know, what does it mean for us in action to to be able to to create those spaces when it's you know tough? I and that's one of the things. That, that's a good question, um, and it's one of the things I actually have been thinking about for a. Uh, just a while, like, what are we going to do to help each other? Especially, like you said, the times like this, like now. Um, and of course, there's a whole conversation to be had about, I firmly believe in putting money directly in the hands of like grassroots organizations, mutual aid <laughs> organizations, like the, that kind of that kind of work is central. That's basically how people continue on. That's how people get through every day, is that kind of work at that scale. Um, beyond that, finding other ways to engage in um in exchanging resources and looking out for one another in a community like in different uh, in a sense of political solidarity right so that means that changes how we we think about like the workplace and how different people are affected at work and how they're treated it means we think about different things regarding like what 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 kind of jobs do these people in these communities have like, are they living wages? Like, it, it leads us to ask a series of different kinds of questions. But most importantly, I think the first, the most immediate thing, action that can be taken is to make sure that you're finding and contributing to like black and indigenous and like other colonized peoples, community, grassroots community organizations who are already doing the work. Because we just need to make sure the work is still done <laughs> more than anything else. And then if there, but if there is something else that is a need, you see that there's a communal need, then that means something needs to be done around working together with other people to start an organization. I have one more follow up to that, especially because of the last thing that you said. Um, and I know that you have feelings about um, popular books on anti-racism and even race uh, and science uh, issues. Um, how can we get to a place, especially as science communicators, right, and people who tell stories about science, um, how can we get to a place where we can touch on more nuance about those popular literature that people are sharing, that's going viral, things like that, where it's it's more attuned to what's actually happening in the stuff that you're, you've talked about today? I think really the thing that needs to be happened so that people can contextualize that is it really... There's, and this is one of the things I was thinking about when everybody's general response to like the murder of George Floyd and everything and anti-racism becoming popular for some reason for three seconds and then abolition, it was odd. Um, <laughs> basically what needs to be done is we need a serious overhaul with regards to education with respect to race period. And that requires a crap ton of work. Cause for instance, there are re there are university well technically period nobody can get funding from the NIH if they don't collect racial data 
and generally they're collecting racial identity data. And this is part of some of the stuff I do in my research work. So it's about trying, like, generally the work that we can do is making sure we understand the historiography of race and racism in its relation to our work. So in, in relation to what's going on around us and the people around us, like it's important to know that because once we know that, then we can make more informed uh, decisions regarding what we're going to do about the problem. Oh, it's almost 2.30. I'm hoping that answered the question. I don't know if it did. <laughs> I mean, at some point, I'd love to ask you what you actually thought of Ibram Kendi's book and also, you know. Oh, it's awful. I can tell you that now. <laughs> it's awful. It's but historically like inaccurate. Whole, like, and uh, he doesn't question. know what a definition is. But, <laughs> like, it's a bad book. Like I don't, I don't recommend anybody get it. Like <laughs> there are way better books. I have them listed here and on my website. <laughs> if you want, you want to actually know what happened and understand things, read these things first. And then you will completely understand why everything in Kendi's book, how to be anti-racist, not only tells you doesn't tell you how to be anti-racist, also is not helpful and is ahistorical. Okay, everyone, it is almost 3.30. I think we have time for one more question, if someone has it, and then we will have to let Shea Kiel and the rest of y'all go. Um, so if anyone has one last question, if you want to like raise your hand, I'll just pick the first person I see. No? Isn't it? Okay, well, there is a question in the chat, and so I'll just pick this. Um, um, and so it is from um, D.T. Rossman. Um, and so the comment says, I can see your argument about the origins of racism applying to treatment of other groups, like refugees, for example, Jewish people who went from being categorized as non-white to white and were segregated into neighborhoods like indigenous and black people but transitioned probably due to blending into a capitalist system in their own way. There has been less success with uh, other types of refugees. Are there lessons that can be learned in application to indigenous and black people or is the origin of racism not only dependent upon colonialist motives but also other aspects of history? Okay, so that's a great question. And it's really funny because really the the main component of the last the last part of the question or it like mm -hmm. is it about the origin being dependent on the colonialist motives but also other aspects of history the colonialist motives motives are always connected to other aspects of history some of the central proto prototypes of what we know of as race today that can, that were central to developing race that's europe first had to colonize herself <laughs> Europeans treated each other like crap. That's where it started. And it was predominantly through religious domination, mainly how they treated the Jews. Then it was how they treated the Irish. So those are two good examples, how we, we see how those other components or aspects of history are connected to some of the larger colonialist motives. But ultimately, I think the thing, the lesson that, that can be and should be learned is that we have to make sure that we are principled in our understanding of in our analysis of the problem. For instance, I the solution is not to have more black billionaires. Billionaires shouldn't exist. I don't care what like it don't matter. It, like, you see, like it, either way, that's a problem. Period. So ultimately, this is about resisting those different actions that are taken to try to co-opt social movements and convince people to then do exactly what the state or the status quo requires or requests of them. Oh, well, thank you so much for that again, Shay. Um, and I think we will end our mentor chat on that note. Um, everybody, the recording will be up soon, um, and we'll also add um, a transcript 
of it as well and any other resources from um, Shea Kill. I'll make sure I send that to you. Okay, I'll remind you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> you have a good one. Right. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you.